All right. Well, as I was saying this evening, I'd like to share with you uh, the secrets of winning. Actually, they're not secrets at all, but universal laws that apply to all people equally everywhere at all times and have since the dawn of human history. Successful people work in harmony with these laws. Those who fail to fall like an egg from a very tall chicken. Most of the world's great societies have progressed from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to liberty, liberty to abundance, abundance to selfishness, selfishness to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy to dependency, and from dependency back again into bondage, all within the span of 200 years. All of these great societies broke one or more of these universal laws I will share with you today. They paid for it by a bridge of groans across a bridge of tears, or a stream of tears, as English poet P.J. Bailey put it. Here we are, decades beyond our 200th bicentennial, living in a land so rich and bountiful that the lowest of our middle class are numbered among the top 8% of the world's wealth. How is it then that so many people go plodding on through silent pain, never seeming to get any higher on the mountain of life, finding themselves on the same level decade after decade, no closer to the summit and self-fulfillment at 60 than they were in their 20s, 30s, or 40s? destined, it seems, to die terminally frustrated or perplexed about life. It's not as if these people set out to fail, for we all have dreams, hopes, and plans for success. When I had a real estate office, I interviewed hundreds of sales candidates, and not one ever told me that it was their burning ambition in life to be the biggest failure their family ever produced. Why then? How does it happen? It can be the result of breaking civil laws, moral laws, or spiritual laws. But one thing, one reason, has to be conformity. We are all born unique, but sadly, most people will die copies. The actor Cary Grant once said, Everyone wants to be Cary Grant. Even I want to be Cary Grant. Many of us are trying to be someone or something we are not. Eleanor Roosevelt said, wishful thinking is one of our besetting sins. It is a rare person that does not delude themselves in some way along the path of life. If you see the masses heading in a certain direction, you can be sure that you should be heading in exactly the opposite direction. For the masses are almost always headed in the wrong direction. Mere numbers never determine what is right. This herd instinct causes people to avoid using their brain to do hard thinking. Most people just don't give too much thought about where they are and where they're going in life. I recently overheard a man telling his friend... I used to be lost in the shuffle. Now I just shuffle along with the lost. These people believe in que sera, sera. What will be, will be. They're convinced that they have little or no influence over their own lives. They feel like the passengers when the pilot announced that the plane's compass had malfunctioned and that they weren't sure in what direction they were heading. But not to worry. There was a strong tailwind, and they were making excellent time. There is more to life than the tyranny of the urgent. The Germans say that an hour in America is 40 minutes. We rush, rush, and rush. As I said earlier, we all want to succeed. But what is success? What does it look like to you? How would you describe it? If we aren't sure of what it looks like or where we're going, well, 
is like the man buying an airplane ticket who then who was then asked where he wanted to go. He replied, oh, just anywhere. Is your idea of success the accumulation of wealth? Living in a nice home, driving the latest model luxury automobile. One of the best definitions I've heard is that success isn't necessarily what we've done in life, but how we've done it and what we've left behind. The man who dies rich and leaves a wealthy estate to a son or daughter, but ill-equipped to deal with the true priorities in life, can't be considered successful by any means. The highest levels of achievement in life are reserved for those less concerned about what they get from their labor than what they become by it. Sadly, many people are like the blindfolded man in a dark room looking for a black cat that just ain't in there. They learn the wisdom of the Swedish proverb, too soon old, too late smart, after their vitality is spent. Whether our benchmark for success is education, the amount of personal wealth or possessions we accumulate, or is some measure of it by spiritual growth. One thing is unmistakably true. We don't drift to success, but without a goal which brings a disciplined focus to our life, we most assuredly will drift to failure. There are certain attributes that all truly successful people have in common, and it's these attributes I want to share with you today. All effective people believe in the importance of having goals. Now, most of us start off with good intentions, but those destined for the pantheon of greatness write out their goals because writing out our goals causes us to think in clear, specific terms. Putting your thoughts down on paper eliminates vagueness. Living life without a well-thought-out goal to get us to a clearly defined destination is like the man who became lost while driving and sped up in hopes of finding himself. He didn't find himself. He just got lost in a wider area. By the streets of by and by, Miguel de Cervantes said, one arrives at the house of never. Now, there are two ways to get to the top of an oak tree. We can sit on an acorn or we can plan how to climb the thing. This is one reason why there is no, 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 no real competition and so much unhappiness today. People sitting around waiting for things to change in their life rather than planning and setting goals to achieve what they want in life. Living life without a plan or goal is not living at all. It's only a ticket to the streets where the brokenhearted and the disappointed live. Highly productive people use goals that are smart. That is, their goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-designated. Without a specific goal, we begin to major in the minors. We become preoccupied with the trivial many in life rather than the vital few. I had a salesperson who would waste 80% of their time with clients or customers that were never going to buy. And another one that spent only 20% of their time with that in that area and invested their time, their 20% or 80% of their time with people who were going to do business with them. Goals need to be measurable so we have constant feedback engaging our progress against a standard of performance. Goals must be attainable. Otherwise, we never experience the feeling of viva yo, hooray for me, I'm doing it. We never enjoy the feeling of winning. This robs us of hope. And living a life without hope, Merle Shane points out in her excellent book, Some Men Are More Perfect Than Others, is merely housekeeping. It's just moving the dust around. In order for goals to work, they must be relevant. They must relate to our end game, the prize we're after. 
and we must honestly ask ourselves, is that prize really worth the cost? Is it worth dying on the mountain for? There is no success at bargain basement prices. And goals must be time designated. Too much time allowed in reaching our goals results in procrastination. Oh, I've got time, we think. But delay can be deadly. Too little time allowed in reaching our goal and we put ourselves under needless stress. Goals bring a discipline to our life. Without discipline motivation, we lose our ability to deal with the future. We begin to function based on our feelings and emotions. We take the line of least resistance and settle for short-range profits rather than long-term gains. The Bible says that a person without discipline is like a city whose walls are broken down. Remember, we become what we think about. This wonderful computer we call a brain that comes as standard equipment at birth is like fertile soil. It gives back in rich abundance whatever we plant there. Positive expectations produce positive results. A strong focus helps us to persevere. And it's by perseverance. Charles Spurgeon, the great English Baptist preacher, said, the snail reached the ark. The laurel wreaths in life go to those who finish well, not to those who begin well. All great endings have small beginnings. Focus and perseverance are two of the keys. Now, nature tolerates no long-term robberies. The empty-headed think that life is just a game, just for fun, trying to succeed by taking shortcuts. They mislead themselves, becoming co-conspirators to their own undoing. They lie in ambush for their own lives. The elevator to success is out of order, my friends. We have to take the stairs one step at a time. It's called paying the price. Time and grade. God determines what we may become. We decide what we shall become. Many people waste their lives by getting ready to live, but never really living. Always getting ready to begin to commence to get started, perhaps maybe tomorrow. These people make Hamlet look impetuous and, unfortunately, will forever be numbered among the ne'er-do-wells of life. Live your life by focusing on a purpose that's bigger than you are. Most of us are looking for a calling in life and not just a job. The person with a calling will always outwork, outlast, and out-earn the person who merely works out of a sense of duty. George Bernard Shaw wrote, This is the true joy of life, the being used up for a purpose recognized by ourselves as a mighty one, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, sniveling little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making us happy. We need to man up, as my daughter likes to say. The wishful thinking spend their time watching others make an excellent living by throwing a ball, bouncing a ball, serving a ball, driving a ball, rolling a ball, or kicking a ball, while they while away their lives, sitting in front of their 52-square-inch wall-mounted television. There's more to life than news, sports, and weather. I know a man who went to see the movie Titanic eight times. What did he miss the first seven times he saw the movie? You could take any subject, American history, how to invest wisely in mutual funds, the Bible. Study everything you could find on that topic, and at the end of 90 days, you would know more about that subject than 98% of the people alive in the world today. You could do that with your job, profession, or calling. But mostly, it seems that people are content using their brains for little things. Someone once made the observation that small minds talk about people, 
Average minds talk about events. Big minds talk about ideas. This is another reason why there's really little competition out there today. For the average mind produces a verdict rather than an idea. As I said earlier, the mind is like a fertile soil, so we must be careful what we plant there. For this turf between our ears is a battlefield. Every day, we must contest with the most relentless, powerful enemies known to man. Fear, discouragement, doubt, worry, cynicism, low self-esteem, pettiness, jealousy. Coming against these negative forces of darkness are courage, hope, goodness, confidence, peace, compassion, and the most compelling force of all, love. Abraham Lincoln referred to them as the higher angels of our nature. Well, how do we change? The people who get ahead know that choices, not chance or luck, determines our destiny. They don't blame others or circumstances for where they are in life. Cassius, remarking to Brutus in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, says, The fault, dear Brutus, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. Our outlook should never be determined by circumstances, but by focus. People who are on their way up have a vivid picture in their mind of what success looks like for them. This becomes their compass setting. If we change our actions before we change our picture, our vision, we will keep drifting back to what is comfortable or familiar to us. See yourself as the person you want to be, and your actions will catch up with your picture. Change the way you see yourself, and one day you'll be counted among the fortunate few who find life exhilarating. You'll jump out of bed in the morning, counting your blessings, saying, Good morning, Lord, rather than, Good Lord, it's morning. But persistence is the key. You must calmly, relentlessly pursue your dream and let no man, no man step on your dreams. The Bible says violent men take the kingdom of heaven. Violent men means persistent pursuit. You will win if you persist. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, everything in nature, even dust and feathers, go by laws and not by luck. And that what we sow, so shall we reap. You might be surprised to find yourself reaping from a field different than the one in which you sowed. So don't keep score. If you are willing to do more than you are paid to do, eventually you will be paid for more than you do. It may not come from where you are presently, but it will come, for that's the law. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. So again, don't be concerned about where your reward will come from. Just give of yourself. Do more than is expected of you. This alone will make you stand out from the crowd and give you the edge. You might have heard this law expressed in contemporary terms like we get back what we give out or what goes around comes around. This is the law of mutual exchange working in harmony with the law of sowing and reaping. In the pursuit of your goal, you must be like the prize fighter who, when asked what kind of fighter he was, said, I'm always up or getting up. If he was knocked down, in his mind, he was getting up. Life is too short to give yourself to an inferior purpose. Carl Walenda, the great high-wire aerialist, said, only on the wire is there life. Everything else is merely waiting. Only when we are involved in what we were divinely designed to do will our zest for life 
and work cause us to be jealous of the sleep that robs us from our work. We will experience the daily freshness and joy of a life full of expectation and promise. Better to be a has-been than it never was. To go down swinging in life than to be called out on strikes with the bat still on our shoulder. It is never too late for us to pick up the bat, swing at the ball. If the horse you are riding to your destiny is dead, dismount. This could mean going back to school or taking some special interest courses. It could even mean changing your friends. Life is a series of seasons. Shakespeare said we have many entrances and many exits in our life. And it's as important to know when to leave a thing as it is when to arrive. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but where we go determines whom we meet. Whom we meet determines how we think. How we think determines what we do. And what we do determines our destiny. Maybe it's time to leave the old crowd behind. Basically, there are four kinds of crowds. We must choose which crowd we will become a part of. There are VIPs, VTPs, VNPs, and VDPs. VIPs are very important people, not that they're rich or even influential, but they know more than we know. They're better at what we're trying to get good at. If you want to increase your skill at, say, racquetball, you don't play with someone you can consistently beat unless you just want to feel good. But to reach the top of your game, you must play with someone who's just a little better than you are. Someone who will cause you to stretch in order to come up to their level. Growth always involves a stretch factor. This is certainly pertains to spiritual growth as well. BTPs are very teachable or tradable people. The windows of their mind are always open to receive new ideas. While managing an office of high-volume salespeople, I came to appreciate that it is better to hire an untrained, willing apprentice than a skilled, unhappy cynic. Higher attitude and trained skill. And your life will be easier and you'll live a lot longer. PNPs are very nice people. But many of these people have settled out in life, experiencing what Norm Cousins, late editor of Saturday Review magazine, described as hardening of the categories. These people suffer from calculated or calcified, calcified opinions. VDPs are very draining people. These people are eating the peel in life and throwing away the banana. Born crying, they will live complaining and will die disappointed. They bring goodwill and cheer whenever they leave. They brighten up the room when they walk out of it. They're emotional vampires and will suck the zest for life right out of your very bones. If you're in a business like sales that require you to be upbeat and positive, you want to avoid these people at all costs. They bring death in slow doses. If we ever hope to amount to a hill of beans in life, we must stop asking ourselves, what will others think, and begin asking, what is the right thing for me to do? We must break free from approval addiction. As we said, right is never determined by numbers. One of the marks of a developed person is their willingness to stand alone, one who has the courage to make changes in their life. This is the meaning of redemption. The truth is that most people do not change until the pain of remaining the same becomes greater than the pain of change. And there is always pain in change because we have to change our habits. If you're really serious about improving your life, I want you to try an experiment that will last 30 days. It will change your life forever. 
it won't be easy. But then the great prizes in life are always in direct proportion to the resistance. The next time we are together, I'll share with you a 30-day experiment that will dramatically change your world. Until then, God bless you and uh, keep striving. Yeah, the, the, of course, the number one rule uh, or, or uh, a point is to remember that uh, God has a plan for each one of us. And uh, the idea is not to get God to run alongside of us and our plans, but to get to the point where we're running in harmony alongside of God touching into his plans. Mm. And that's very important. So a lot of this material that I covered uh, would fly with a secular audience, but sadly with a secular audience, because we're either running toward God as God chasers, or we're running away from God because we know that we're under guilt. And so we're trying to avoid an encounter with Christ. Uh, so with with a, a, a secular group, you can't say uh, St. Paul said to Timothy because they don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. And it was interesting, Jeff, when I was doing the programs for Dun & Bradstreet, people would come up to me, Christians would come up to me during the lunch hour or during a break and say, you're a Christian, aren't you? Uh, they they knew the examples. They knew the proverbs that I was uh, that I was mentioning, but I couldn't I couldn't mention in a secular group. I couldn't mention the source. But even the Suki Kos man or the unredeemed man knows truth when they hear it because God put it in our hearts and in our uh, minds. Wow. Mm. Man, that's that's good. That is, I needed to hear that. That's good. Well, you know, my dad used to say, if I give you a buck and you give me a buck, we're both only, uh, we're, we both only have still a buck. But if I give you an idea and you give me an idea, we can be bucks ahead. Mm. <laughs> so you know, there are kingdom, there are kingdom dollars, kingdom bucks. In other words, wow. I can be richer for it if we if we don't want to count the exchange in the in the form of uh, of uh, dollars, we will be richer for it. If you give me an idea, and and you have Jeff, in in the in the short time I've known you, you've given me many a, an idea to chew on, and you know it's like a a cow chewing the cud. Uh, we need to do that. We need to chew the word and swallow it, and then regurgitate it from time to time so that we remember it and we never lose a sight uh, of that uh, or lose it out of our minds. We, we need remembering, then we need things new, more than we need mm-hmm. things new. Wow, that's good. Yeah, that's amen. Amen. That's, that's beautiful. Star six, if you want to chime in and have a word or comment, a question for John Michael Grogan, our keynote speaker, feature speaker for our 555 conference call. Uh, just star six your line if you want to chime in or have a question or comment. Yeah, that's uh, what you said, and I'm glad that those, those last remarks there are those uh, partly closing remarks in terms of just uh, walking with the Father and, uh, and allowing Him to... Um, to to express himself through you as his habitation. The word says that we are a habitation of God. Yeah. We're not our own. And so, but I know many yeah. times people uh, get wrapped up uh, in their own, you know, sense of purpose versus God's sense of purpose. And it really leads me to one of the things you said this morning when I spoke to you uh, that really struck a chord in my heart, and it was to help people with their needs. Uh, and then give them your Jesus. Talk just briefly about um, that ideal and how that come to 
come to fruition for you, and how do you apply that? I mean, how do you, what, what do you, well, I how do you call apply that? that? I refer to that, uh, Jeff, as a, like a long-term evangelism. In other words, uh, in, instead of saying, well, brother, I'll pray for you, we take the time to get involved. I have a little uh, friend. She's a 30-year-old black girl, a uh, precious little girl, down, uh, lives on the streets. And, uh, I, and I've taken a personal interest in, in helping her. And so that's that's not a that's not a sprint that's that's a uh, a marathon. And uh, uh, I want to get her to the position where she believes in the power of the Holy Spirit because the particular denomination that she belongs to um, minimizes the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, uh, but to win win their confidence, this is the thing. In other words. If I'm selling you, Jeff, if I'm selling you, uh, say, uh, uh, a new car or anything, I have to first sell myself to you before I sell the product. In other words, you've got to believe in me. You've got to believe in what I say is true, my integrity, my sense of helpfulness. I've got to sell myself first. So what what I say is uh, an effective evangelism is where you help someone in their need and by doing so you earn the right to go back and say phil you know how i helped you with your finances well i've got someone that uh, is the king of finances and uh, uh, he can help you much more so than i can You've got to immediately have his attention, and he'll give you this. Uh, if we see ourselves as instruments of love, uh, as instruments of peace, as instruments of joy, then it would supersede how we feel. It would supersede what people think of us. It would yes. supersede um, what we have in our lives, um, and it will get back to the essence of who we are. Yes. And so, yeah, when we are acting in love, we're actually acting in ourselves. It's probably the closest identity of us being ourselves is when we act in love. Uh, yes. Apart from acting in love, we're not ourselves. And so the well, awakening well, and enlightenment comes through that. So it's amazing. Uh, God bless you. That's you've. Uh, uh, the more and more, as the word says, iron sharpens iron, as one man sharpens the countenance oh, of yes. one another. Yes. Proverbs yeah. twenty-seven, seventeen. Uh, any last uh, remarks before we? Uh, yeah, I have a very appropriate uh, uh, remark to share. Uh, I was born and raised Catholic. Uh, now I I am evangelical, but I was born and raised Catholic, and I became an altar boy. And um, at that time, back in uh, we're talking uh, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. The Mass was offered in Latin. And at the end of the Mass, the priest would turn around. Of course, their, their, their back was to the congregation in the old days. <clears throat> and, uh, but the, at the end of the Mass, the priest would turn around, and he would signal a cross with his hands, and he would say, <clears throat> Ite Mesa Es, which means, <clears throat> go forth, get out. Take the, take the gospel out into the hinterlands, the highways and the byways, and share it with people. And so I would say uh, to the men who were listening tonight, e S. take it out to others. Be a spokesman. Mm. Wow. Man, that's awesome. That is beautiful. Mm. That is beautiful. You want to close us in prayer, um, John Michael? Yes, um, yes, I would like to. That's a, an honor and a privilege, and I appreciate it. Amen. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, our high tower, our shield and buckler, in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit who resides in us. 
and we say thank you. Thank you for your sonship. Thank you, Jesus, that we can cover ourselves in your blood. And in so doing, we have righteousness through our belief. In the sight of the Father, we have sonship. We are so fortunate. And Lord, uh, I, I would pray, uh, and we would pray corporately, that that uh, uh, we may influence, we may be your vessels to influence so many out there that are tripping through life blindfolded, not knowing, not knowing where they're going or what life is really all about. And so they self-medicate through drugs and, uh, and alcohol and cigarettes and uh, joints and anything else that brings them temporary relief, only to find out that when the pleasure, the momentary pleasure is over, the pain is even greater. And so, Lord, uh, give us the opportunity to influence people for the kingdom uh, with portfolio. Ambassadors with portfolio, Lord. And we pray this in your holy, precious, powerful, and beautiful name, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen.